Hey guys, this is week eight, our last week of part two, Principles of Hearing God, Talking with God. And um, this is the normal standard teaching that I w would normally give. Uh, but the Lord had me do something different live in person. I will record that uh, also. So let's get started. This is week eight, our final two E's. Execute and experience. Execute, obey. Uh, do what God tells you to do once you hear. And then experience. You learn and grow in your ability to hear as you experience God and get uh, kind of on-the-job training and practice. So let's start talking about execute. The main points are, number one, just simply to obey and act upon what you hear. Uh, if you hear something, then, then do it. Biblical faith is God speaks, plus we hear, plus we obey. If you look in Scripture, if you look at Hebrews 11, um, that, that chapter, and look at what um, the, the heroes of faith did, they heard what God said, and they did it. We often turn it around and make it that we speak, God hears, and he obeys. That's what we think prayer is. That's what we think it's all about. But that's reversed. That's reverse faith. Biblical faith is God speaks, you hear, which is what we're here to learn about, hearing God, right? We want to know how to hear him and know that it's him, but then we have to obey. We have to do it. Faith is not complete until we obey and act upon what God is telling us to do. And now think about this. Obedience also brings more hearing and blessing. A good analogy is it's like starting a new job. As you are faithful in your basic duties, your manager will slowly give you more and more responsibility. So as you obey and prove that you're willing to do the right things, what your boss tells you, he will give you more and more responsibilities because he knows he trusts you. He knows that you will do what you're supposed to do. And in one sense, this is true with God. And lastly, um, uh, there's the principle of one step at a time. Often the Lord does not give you the whole plan. He makes you act upon the first step to get to the next step. And so we have to just trust him and do what he says one step at a time. He may not often tell us the whole plan in advance, so don't expect that. Um, doing the will of God after hearing from God is the goal of our lives. Our goal is obedience, and we'll see why. We hear to obey. Um, we hear uh, to obey. We don't hear to decide what to do or think about it. We hear to do what God says, period. Um, obedience, which is what we're talking about here, is an act of faith and relationship. Um, it's an act of love. Jesus defined love as obeying his word and worship. Think of uh, Romans 12, 1 to 2, where you your act of worship is obedience and giving your heart to the Lord. And one way to think about it is we execute God's will to worship him um, from love. Now, here's a picture of someone's at work, and um, they don't want to listen to uh, what their bosses are telling them to do. Now they're getting in trouble. You can see they're closing your ears. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Well, they're either going to get fired uh, or, uh, at least temporarily, they're not going to get any more instructions. So... Um, don't think that it's any different between you and God. He's your boss. He's your Lord. And if you're not willing to listen to what he says, he may not continue to speak to you. Um, and remember that if you won't open your Bible, you're telling God, I don't want to hear your voice either. So be careful there. So let's talk about love and obedience. Look what Jesus says here in John 4, chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear uh, is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So Jesus is defining love um, as obedience. Right? Now think about this, my commandments and my word. He says, if you keep my commandments, if you keep my word, well, where are you going to find them? The only place to find them is in the Bible. So you can't love God unless you are in the word and know what the word says. How can you obey something if you don't 
know what you're supposed to obey. So you need to be in the Word and know the Word, the whole Bible, the, not, not just uh, sections of the New Testament that you like to read. If you're serious, if you're planning to win, you will want to know everything in the Word and try and keep it. So love is obedience to the Word. Now look, it's not a feeling or emotion towards God. We often think that like, oh, I just, I just love the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that, so I'm, I'm making fun. Uh, but that's not how God views it. Now that, again, if you have a heart for God and emotions and feeling towards the Lord, that's great. But they need to be paired with obedience. They can't replace obedience. So be very careful. You got to know your Bible. You can't love God if you're not in the Word and doing the Word. And think about this. You can't obey the great commandment. So let, let's look at this. Here's the great commandment that Jesus said. Someone asked uh, Jesus, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So the great commandment is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And I think oftentimes when we think of this, we think of the emotion, we think of the feeling, how we feel towards God, we're grateful towards him, we have this like nice, loving feeling inside when we think about him and what he's done. But remember, that's good. That, that's, that's honorable. God, I'm sure, appreciates that, but that's not what he's after. If love equals obeying, right? We just studied it in John 14. Let's replace the word love with what it really means. See, there it is. You shall obey the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Ah, it's different now, isn't it? You probably are like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, that's not the great commandment. Yes, it is. The great commandment is to obey the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And that's a totally different thing because in order to obey, you need to know what you're supposed to obey. Um, obedience is doing what God says without question. So um, we really need to make sure we're right here because if this is the great commandment and that's loving God, then we need to make sure all, we're all about obeying. Now, let's move on to Genesis 22 because this is a really um, great story and um, there's lots of interesting things in here. Let's first just read it. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I, will, I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and lays it, laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. So this is a story in Genesis where basically uh, Abraham is told to sacrifice uh, Isaac on a mountain which God will show him. So let's take a look, further look at this. Now, interestingly here, um, look at uh, the words that I have highlighted and see what you see. The first thing to notice is that... Um, God calls Isaac his only son. Now, that's not necessarily true, is it? There, were, there was another son. That's another story, right? And this is the first instance of the words love in verse 2 and worship in verse 5. So here, remember we said that, that uh, loving God is obedience. It's an act of love. It's an act of worship. And the first mentions of love and worship in all the Bible... Uh, involves someone sacrificing uh, their son and obeying, right? Now think about this. Uh, doesn't that sound familiar that, that uh, a father's going to sacrifice his only son in an act of love and worship? And look what else we have there in, in blue. 
uh, we know that the location is going to be in Moriah, and um, and it's uh, on the third day that this happens. So you can begin to see that this is going to be painting a picture of um, Jesus on the cross. And also notice in verse 6 there in yellow that um, Abraham took the wood and laid it on Isaac. Just remember that, 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 that Isaac carried the wood. So if we look at this story a little closer, here's a map. They started in uh, Beersheba and they went to Moriah. Now you can see there Jebus. Uh, that's basically where the area right where Jerusalem was or would be in the future. Um, and look at the verse here in Chronicles. It says, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So what's really interesting here is that the place that uh, Abraham is to offer um, Isaac is Moriah, and we know that Moriah is basically the mountain on which the Temple Mount sits in Jerusalem. And it's going to get even more interesting. Here's a topographic map from the Temple Mount, and you can see um, the red dot there on the lower portion uh, is where the Temple Mount is. And over and up, up to the left there, another red dot is where Golgotha is. That's where Jesus was sacrificed. And actually, the topographic map reveals that the very highest point of Mount Moriah, this whole area in and around Jerusalem, is Mount Moriah. It's built on a mountain, is Golgotha, not even where the Temple Mount is. So then if we superimpose, we can see that... Um, <clears throat> Jesus was crucified on Mount Moriah at the highest point, which is Golgotha. And that's exactly the same mountain where Abraham was to offer Isaac. So really an incredible uh, foreshadowing and, re and early enactment of the cross in every way. Let's review, let's review this. What are we talking about? Well, we have the father offers his only son, right, and we have this mention there of, and it's happening on the third day, okay? Now think about this. The son, Isaac, carries the wood on his back up the mountain like Jesus carrying the cross. There were two other men with them, if you remember from the story and read carefully, just like there was a thief on the left and on the right. And we know it's the same general ro location as Calvary. Now, we don't know this for sure, but knowing God and his precision and his amazing details, I would bet you that um, this happened exactly where Golgotha would be. I can't prove it, but I bet you that that's very highly likely. And when you read the text technically, um, uh, it really says that God will provide himself the lamb. Think about that. God provides himself the lamb. Um, is the way it actually reads in the original language. And that's kind of what God did, right? God provided um, himself as the lamb. Jesus is the lamb and Jesus is God. And like we just mentioned, it's the first mention of love and worship in the Bible. And here we have in verse 8, And Abraham said, My son God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now, really interesting, too, is that Hebrews comments on this. Uh, look what Hebrews 11 says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Remember, there was also, um, uh, uh, he, had, he had another son, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So Abraham had more than one son, but God's saying that Isaac is his only begotten son. And what Hebrews is telling us is that when um, God, when Abraham received him back uh, in the figurative sense on the third day, it's like Jesus being raised from the dead is what, what this is trying to say. So Abraham's on Mount Moriah in the same location, acting out the Bible story of the crucifixion. 
and uh, a substitute, a lamb, comes and saves his son. So it's really an incredible picture. We could talk about this all day, but we need to move on. But just go back and marvel over that story. Now, we need to talk about 1 Samuel 15. Um, 1 Samuel 15 is basically the story of King Saul, where he's told to go out and uh, eliminate the Amalekites, and um, he partially obeys. This is a good story about partial uh, obedience. So let's look at a few things from here. What we can learn from this story is that partial obedience is disobedience. Um, God wants obedience over sacrifice and worship. And the other interesting thing in this story is that if you don't kill the Amalekites, they will come back to kill you. Um, we can't get into this in detail, but if you look in the Old Testament, the Amalekites are often a type of flesh. Um, that's kind of the typology there that you can find in Scripture. And um, if you don't completely eradicate your flesh, it will come back and get you. And the reason that this is interesting is that, that there's some controversy as to what happened, but uh, one of the chapters of the Bible says that Saul was actually killed by an Amalekite. That's controversial, but it's interesting in the picture. And certainly we know that Haman, who tried to eradicate the Jews, was an Agagite and came from King Agag, king of the Amalekites, that Saul spared. So Saul did not completely think of it, get rid of the Amalekites and King Agag. And hundreds of years later, there's a relative who's going to try and exterminate their entire uh, population through Haman. And in a similar fashion, if you don't get rid of your flesh and put it to death, it's going to come back and get you. If you leave a little bit, it will come for you to destroy you. So a great picture there. Let's keep talking a little bit more about uh, execute. We need to quickly look at James because this is an important um, verse about obedience. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So this part here is talking about that that's, you're deceiving yourself. You're looking in the mirror and you observe your, what you're really like, but then you walk away and forget deceiving yourself, telling yourself usually that you're good. And this is very common. But then look what it says in verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So let's look at this a little bit more carefully. So the mirror we know here is the Word of God, and it's going to reveal sin and truth. It's going to reveal who you really are. And so we have a man who looks at the mirror, looks at the Word, sees his true reflection, but turns away to forget what he saw. He doesn't want to see or Remember the truth. And in fact, like the scripture says there in verse 22, he's deceiving himself. He's, he's forgetting on purpose so he doesn't have to face the truth and he's deceiving himself. But the person who looks and stays in the mirror, who stays in the word and does what it says and faces up to the fact that it's kind of ugly and rotten, uh, will be blessed in what he does. And so... This is related to doing the word. You, you, if you turn away and don't do the word, you're deceiving yourself. But if you look at the word and do what the word says and let it do its work, you're obeying God, you're loving God, and you will be blessed. So you need to ask yourself when you look in the mirror, you know, what do you see and what do you do? Uh, are you willing to look and stay in the word and continue in it and do what it says? Because think about it. The word is the will of God. Uh, we want to say, oh, I want to hear from God, but we won't open the Bible and do what it says. The word shows us our sin, areas we need to prove upon, but we like to forget what we look like and pretend we're okay. We avoid acting on the image that we see. So here's a man looking in the mirror. And now when he looks at himself, he thinks, hey, hey, look, I'm all that. Look, he's, he's, he, he likes himself right? But he's deceiving himself. That's not what really there. When you look into the word, 
what you're going to see is that the image is really evil. Yeah, that's right. You're not a good person. None of us are. You're, you're evil inside apart from God. And you need to accept that and face up to it that the only thing good in you, the only one who's good is the Lord. Right? If you keep looking, then you will see sin and the evil, sinful nature. But the good thing is that then this is going to lead to repentance and change, doing what the word says, right? And that will bring blessings as you change and obey. Very quickly, there's this story from Luke chapter 5. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to do a, a quick summary. But this is the story where Jesus is speaking around the Sea of Galilee, and he borrows Simon's boat to teach, and then he, after the teaching, asks him to push out and to let his nets down for a catch. And basically, this is a great story of sequential obedience and how you can experience great things by obeying little things. Um, in yellow there, we have the three sequential steps of obedience that led to a great blessing. The first thing Jesus said was put out your boat, right? He, he let Jesus use his boat and he put it out from the land so he could teach. Then once he had stopped, he said, um, uh, uh, Simon, launch out your boat into the deep. Simon did that. And then once they got out into the deep and Simon had obeyed that second step, he said, now let down your nets for a catch. Now they had toiled all night and hadn't caught anything. And so the whole thing to the fishermen was a little ridiculous. They know these waters. They, they know they're not going to catch anything. But he nevertheless did what Jesus said. He obeyed, and it led to the, one of the biggest catches ever. And so what we can learn from this story is that three simple acts of faith led to a huge increase in faith because now Simon realizes who Jesus is and that you know he's someone really great and awesome of God. And he's, you know, gets on his knees and says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. Right? Think about it. He lent uh, what he had to Jesus and Jesus took care of what he didn't have. He gave Jesus his boat. Simon didn't have a catch. Jesus gave him the catch. Um, and, you know, in, in following God, some of the steps may not make logical sense. But if you don't obey them, you can miss some of the greatest blessings by failing to do simple acts of faith. So, you know, when God asks you to do a few simple things, just do them. And uh, think of Peter who just lent him his boat, launched out into the deep, and threw his nets over. Three very simple things to do in life. Even one of them didn't make sense, the last one, but it brought great blessings. All right, we're almost done. Let's move on to quickly talk about experience. Let's review what we learned for experience. Uh, hearing from God takes time, practice, and experience, just like learning any new skill in life. It's, it's, it, you learn as you go. And think about it, we often learn the most from our mistakes, so don't be discouraged when you mess up. If your heart is honestly seeking God's will and trying to hear Him correctly, He will even use your mistakes to help you grow and learn. And it takes time to get to know someone and learn exactly what their voice sounds like. This is normal in our earthly relationships and true with God. You learn uh, someone by being with them over time and you learn what their voice sounds like you learn you know how to interact with them better and even the most famous people from the bible like abraham um, uh, and david uh, they were flawed and they made some big mistakes but god used them despite themselves and this is good news we we don't have to be perfect we can realize that even the great heroes of the bible made some big boo-boos and they still ended up doing just fine. They paid for them. Sin has its consequences, but we don't feel like we have to be perfect. Uh, this is an important verse that relates to experience from Hebrews. And, you know, I like to talk about spiritual growth and spiritual health and that when we're saved, Jesus said you're born again, which means you're when you first become a Christian, you're a spiritual baby. And how the Corinthian church, Paul said they were still babies, you know, drinking milk they weren't hadn't grown up to be on solid food and this is important because um, we're going to see that hearing and being able to know and understand what god is saying does require some growth um, and spiritual health for it to happen and for you to learn to to hear him better over time 
uh, look at what Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So here's this theme again of, of, of being an abnormally immature spiritual baby Christian. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There it is. He's still a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of their senses have exercised to discern both good and evil. So what we see here is that you know, experience and learning to hear God require time and growth. And growth requires health, and, um, and health requires food and cleanliness. You have to be um, you have to be healthy and you have to be eating. If you're not eating, or if you're sick with disease, it can stunt your growth. You'll be sick. You won't be able to have a normal life. And what's true physically is true spiritually. So we need to make sure that we're growing and healthy as a Christian. There's this story from Samuel. Gosh, you could teach on this story all day, but just a few points. Samuel is a young lad living in the tabernacle um, um, with Eli. He's been dedicated there by his mom, and so he's dedicated and set apart to the Lord, and the Lord begins to uh, speak to him at night while he's sleeping. And uh, the interesting thing is that we can look at Samuel as you know a type of person who's going to learn to hear from God and learn some principles from him. The first thing we need to look at is the spiritual life of Samuel. If you look at Samuel as a type of person who's going to be set up to hear God, he was dedicated and set apart to God. He was living for the Lord, right? He, he was living where God lived in God's house. He was lived close to God's presence, and he served God daily. Um, he was, that's what his life was. And he was being mentored. He was trying to grow. Now, Eli wasn't the perfect mentor, obviously, but he was being mentored, right? So these are things that you can look for in your own life if you want to hear the Lord and be able to know whether it's him or not. Be dedicated, living for God, stay close to his presence, serve him daily, and you should be meant being mentored by someone. And probably even if you're far enough along, mentoring someone else. But the practical life, right, when did Samuel hear? He heard when he when everything was quiet and he was alone. But he had to learn to hear God, right? Uh, he had to experience it on his own. But he did get counsel from someone with experience, and he grew in the Lord over time. So Samuel heard the Lord's voice. He thought it was Eli. He heard him again. He thought it was Eli. Then Eli says, hey, Samuel, this is the Lord speaking to you. Go back and start interacting with the Lord. He does. And then it says over time, you know, he became to be known as a prophet. So there was a learning curve here. Samuel didn't get it. He didn't understand it. Someone helped him to hear the Lord speaking uh, to him. Uh, but it took time and experience is the principle. And the other principle is that um, Samuel was in a proper uh, spiritual life to hear from God. And we need quiet time. Uh, we need to be alone and have time when we can listen to God. Here's the graph of spiritual maturation, right? What we don't want to remain is the baby. Uh, we want to grow up. And if we plot on our graph here, spiritual growth and maturity along the bottom and our ability to hear and understand God as we grow, that will increase. Think about a baby's ability to understand uh, and, and obey what his father says versus a mature, uh, healthy adult male. Obviously, it's much greater and increases over time as you grow and mature and have experience. The same is true spiritually. So in summary, let's look at our um, nine E's of uh, relationship uh, and how they relate. We've studied the nine E's. That's all the ways to confirm whether you're hearing God or not and how to set yourself up to uh, hear God. The, the principles of hearing God are the nine E's. So we have expect. Expect comes from your relationship. Uh, expressing, right? That's prayer. You're praying. Expelling. You're getting rid of the bad things in your life through surrender, surrender and repentance. 
And then things that encompass the entire relationship, all aspects are eliminating. Uh, when you fast, you're kind of working in all these different areas of your relationship. Uh, when you're listening, ears, remember we want to listen, we want to have time to listen. Listening is active. Listening happens by your relationship with the Lord and being in the Word and listening to what He's saying. Uh, engaging the Word, right? We need to be in the Word to hear from God. Uh, it goes over there with the Word of God. And then remember we had examine. We're going to now check and see, how, am I really hearing God right? And very quickly, I'm going to bring this in over top. Remember, if you have this handout, that even all of the eight C's of examine, there the examine is in red, all the eight C's are in blue. Uh, we went over this last week. All of the eight C's are um, related directly to the relationship. And then execute there at the bottom. Uh, when you obey God, all aspects of the relationship are involved. And the same with experience. They are on the top. And that's really the key that, that I will focus on in tonight's uh, message from God is that um, he wants us to focus on this relationship and review its importance because we can't do this apart from the relationship. You can't take the study not have the relationship and, and, and engage and expect and express, um, it's going to be very difficult to do, if not impossible. So in review, what did we learn? We learned in week one to expect. Expect to hear from God or you won't and express, to express our desires to hear from God, to pray about our prayers, express our heart. In week two, we looked at expel and, and eliminate the principles of removing any hindrances to hearing God, such as sin, relational problems, or other distractions, and eliminate, to eliminate food and fast from it, that fasting can be used strategically at certain times to help us. In week three, we looked at ears and engage. We need to listen, take time to listen for God's responses in a quiet place, and we need to engage in the Bible. It's the Word of God and His main method of communication. And then we looked at examine, and over several weeks, four, five, uh, six, and seven, and we looked at the eight C's. I won't review them all, but the, those are the eight C's. And finally, um, in week eight, we looked at execute and experience. And we learned that we have uh, 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 issues of attitude uh, in expecting and expressing. And then we have actions that we need to take if and then we have analysis, right? We're analyzing. And there comes week eight. It came in late. But basically, uh, week eight with executing experience uh, is all three. You have the right attitude, you're taking action, and you're analyzing as you execute uh, and experience. So that's the end of the study. Um, use these principles going forward. Go back to especially your eight C's. If you're wondering whether something's from God, work through them and use uh, all the principles that you've learned. Thank you very much. It was a blessing and honor to uh, uh, teach this study, which God has uh, given me to give to the church. And I hope that uh, it has blessed you. Thank you and good night.